great resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then, and how sad to think this, uh, they also who have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. But now is Christ risen from the dead. There is an apocryphal story about the chapters of the Bible. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And uh, some time ago, they conducted uh, an election. Uh, and the uh, nature of the election was to choose a chapter that they felt was the greatest of all the chapters. Well, there were a number of candidates, and each candidate received uh, a lot of votes uh, in the running concerning the greatest chapter in the Bible as voted on by the other chapters, Genesis 1 and Psalm 53 and Isaiah 53, Romans 8. But we're told that the winner was 1 Corinthians 15. Well, whether that's true or not, I suppose it wasn't. And if the chapters could vote, I don't know. But uh, I believe I can say this, that throughout the years, theologians have indeed uh, determined that Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 15 are two of the greatest chapters in the New Testament, and Genesis 1, Psalm 53, Isaiah, Psalm 23, and Isaiah 53, the greatest in the Old Testament. We're going to, in this final of two sessions on the resurrection of Christ, and by the way, this is number 11 in our 12-fold series on what the Bible says about Jesus, great truths from the God's, from God's Word. The resurrection described, then the resurrection documented. And we're going to go back to this greatest of all chapters, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And whatever else you can say about these uh, 58 verses, uh, certainly this chapter gives more information on the resurrection, not only of the Savior, but of the saint also, than any other chapter in the Bible. I could probably say any other five chapters put together in the Bible. This is indeed the resurrection chapter. And here Paul describes the following, and I have, a, I believe, a tenfold outline, and each word begins with the letter P. It is the, the prominence of the resurrection of Christ, and that's verses 1 to 4. And here Paul says that the resurrection is the focal point in reference to salvation. There's no salvation apart from the resurrection. And it is a focal point in reference to the Scriptures. Uh, the Scriptures could not and would not and should not have been written had it not been for the resurrection because there would have been nothing to write about if the resurrection had not taken place. There would be no salvation, no hope, no mercy, no grace, no heaven, no eternal life with the Savior apart from the resurrection. So it's, uh, it is impossible to over-exaggerate uh, the resurrection. And then the proof of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 and 11. In these verses, Paul presents a twofold proof, the resurrection appearances of Christ, and we'll look at those pretty soon, and the proof of the puddings in the eating, and then the conversion experience of Paul himself. Now, why would he offer this as a proof to the resurrection? Well, Paul according to his own testimony, he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 
And uh, I would think an Adolf Hitler, a Joe Stalin, or a Nero, or a Genghis Khan, or a, a Haman, uh, or a Jezebel, and other ungodly people would be worse. But Paul says, of whom I am chief. And what he's saying here is that something incredible happened in my life uh, to turn me from uh, a vicious wolf preying on God's sheep to uh, the most faithful uh, sheepdog and collie dog that God ever had in corralling the sheep. And that event was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you have the promise of the resurrection, you have the proof of the resurrection, and then you have the priority of the resurrection. Uh, someone has said, and we said this at, a, I think, the beginning of the last session, that the resurrection of Christ is the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence of the Christian faith. But uh, the priority, the all-importance of it, if one denies, as liberals do, the resurrection, the, the bodily resurrection of Christ, then he is forced to six horrible conclusions. Number one, all gospel preaching has been, is now, and always will be utterly and completely useless. In our own country alone, America, there's some 400,000 churches, probably at least half of those, if not more, that's 200,000, uh, would be evangelical churches. And all those pastors to add all of American history, the tens of thousands, the millions of sermons they preached and that's just in our own country, the billions of sermons that have been preached uh, in church history, beginning with uh, the apostles and then uh, Polycarp and some of the, uh, of the uh, uh, in origin, the, uh, the, the early church fathers, all those sermons would be useless if the resurrection had not taken place. Secondly, all past, present, and future faith is futile if there be no resurrection. Who cares? And it's true, 100 years from now, who will know the difference? And then all preachers become notorious liars. Sometimes preachers are notorious liars, unfortunately. But that means all godly preachers, if the resurrection be not a fact. And then all living Christians are still in their sins. All departed Christians are in hell. And all reason and purpose for life itself is destroyed. The poet has written, Oh, to have no Christ, no Savior, how lonely life must be. Like a sailor lost and driven on a wide and shoreless sea. Oh, to have no Christ, no Savior, no, no hand to clasp thine own. Through the dark veil of shadows, thou must press thy way alone. If Christ, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. And so you have the prominence, the proof, the priority, and now the program of the resurrection of Christ. Uh, Paul says, For as in Adam all die, even so as in Christ shall all may be, be made alive. But every man in his own order. Now, the word order is the Greek word tagma. It's spelled T-A-G-M-A -A in the English language. And actually, it refers to a parade. In this case, a military parade. And Paul here is describing the resurrection as a parade. And uh, this resurrection parade consists of three sections. The first part is the resurrection of Christ himself. 1 Corinthians 15, 23, Christ, the first fruits. Just stop to think, why is his resurrection referred to as the first fruits, the very first resurrection, when you have three Old Testament resurrections, and in the New Testament, before Jesus was raised again from the dead, he raised up Lazarus from the dead, he raised up a little girl, uh, Jairus' 12-year-old daughter, and he raised up the uh, dead boy belonging to the widow of Nain. And uh, so there actually there were six resurrections before Christ, but not so because Christ was the ultimate resurrection because true biblical resurrection carries with it the promise that the person raised will never die. Did you ever hear a sermon? in your all years of going to church, on the second funeral of Lazarus. Now, you know he died, and we know something about his first funeral, and Jesus raised him again from the dead. You know the old boy died again? And did you ever hear something? No, we know nothing about his second death. But you see, the resurrection of Christ is first fruits because Jesus died, but he rose again, and he'll never die. As we will be raised again at the rapture, 
if we're departed when Jesus comes. That is to say, if our bodies are corrupting in the grave and we'll never die again. And then uh, the first part is the resurrection of Christ. The second part is the rapture resurrection. Afterward, they that are Christ at His coming. And then the final part of the resurrection, incur, and this includes Old Testament and tribulational believers at the beginning of the millennium. And Jesus said, then shall come the end when He will deliver up the kingdoms uh, to uh, the Savior. So you have the resurrection of Christ leading the parade, then the rapture resurrection, that's next, and then the resurrection of Old Testament and tribulational saints right before the glorious millennium. And so uh, we have the, uh, the prominence, the proof, the priority, the program, and the prompting of the resurrection. The resurrection factor should motivate me to pick up the fallen banner of departed believers. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29. He says, If the dead, if Christ be not raised from the dead, then what's the use of being baptized in the sense of identifying ourselves with those whose lives have been destroyed by the enemy and where the believer would run in then and pick up the fallen banner to be identified with them? Uh, but if there's no resurrection, uh, then we're fools to give our life for an empty faith. But then there is the, the pattern of the resurrection. And in uh, verse 37, Paul illustrates the resurrection by a grain of wheat. Now, you place a grain of wheat in the ground and it dies. And the only reason it dies is because in the very death of the grain, it sprouts forth life. And later on, a, an object similar to the grain, changed somewhat, but similar to the grain, bursts forth uh, from the ground. So it's like a grain of wheat. And then you have the perfection of the resurrection. And here Paul contrasts the new body to the old body. And by the way, what about the new you? What kind of body will you have? Well, we know according to Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, and 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, that our body will be fashioned and shaped like unto His glorious resurrection body. So if you want to know something about, as I said, the new you, what's your body going to be like, then all we have to do is uh, concern ourselves with what the body, uh, the glorified body of Christ was like, and that's the kind of body we're going to have. Now, here's some facts about the glorified body of Christ. Um, his new body had flesh and bone. In Luke chapter 24, you remember he appeared to the disciples and they were afraid. They thought they'd seen a spirit. He said, touch me, handle me. Catch this now. For a spirit hath not flesh and bone. Now, to be sure, be glorified flesh and bone. It won't be just spirit, though. A bunch of uh, disembodied spirits running around uh, throughout all eternity. It's a body of flesh and bone. Secondly, Jesus ate food in this new body. The little kid says, Mommy, can, will we eat pizza in heaven? Well, son or daughter, if that's what floats your boat, yes. But we will be able to eat in that new body because Jesus ate in His glorified body in John 21. And then His new body still bore the marks of His crucifixion. And uh, that certainly ought to answer the question that a lot of times people ask, and I don't know why they ask it. And here's the question. Will we recognize our loved ones in heaven? Well, of course we will. I mean, that's the blessed hope. If we won't recognize each other, what's the purpose of the resurrection? Jesus was recognized by Thomas because of the nail prints in his hand and the wound in his side, glorified nail prints, glorified wound, but we will, as we bore the image of the earthly, we'll bear the image of the heavenly. And his new body was not subjected uh, to the laws of time and gravity, to, to material laws, because he was able in that body of flesh and bone to pass through solid doors and perhaps move about at the speed of thought, etc. But it'll be a glorified body, a body not subjected uh, to material laws. Wonderful body. Uh, thus, the new body is as superior, Paul says, to the old body as man is to beast, as heaven is to the earth, and as the sun is uh, to the moon. Uh, you have the prominence, uh, the proof, the priority, the program, the prompting, the pattern, the perfection, 
about all the peas I can get in this pod here that we're developing, the promise of the resurrection. Some of the most exciting verses in all the Bible are in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 53, where Paul says, Behold, I show unto you a mystery. We shall not all sleep the sleep of death, but we shall all be changed in the moment, the twinkling of an eye. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall must put on immortality. So when, the, when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall come to pass the statement, O death, where is thy sting? Now he's talking about two kinds of bodies here. It's a twofold promise. At the rapture, the bodies of living believers will be changed without dying, and that the rapture, the bodies of departed believers will be raised without corruption. So he says, this corruptible, referring to the bodies of departed believers, shall put on incorruption, and this mortal, referring to the bodies of living believers, shall put on immortality. So that's the twofold promise of the resurrection. And then number nine, the purpose of the resurrection. Simply stated, his resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, assures victory over man's final enemy, physical death. Now, let me say that the believer has five mortal enemies, terrible enemies, the world, the flesh, the devil, spiritual death, and physical death. Now, we are given victory here on earth over the world, the flesh, the devil, spiritual death, but as you may know, certainly we all know, that believers still are struck down with heart attacks and strokes and cancer, and they're killed, etc. That's physical death. But the purpose of the resurrection uh, is that to assure that finally the last enemy, physical death, will be destroyed. And here Paul says, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought the past brought to pass the, the saying that is written, speaking of physical death, death is swell, swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The prominence, the proof, the priority, the program, the prompting, the pattern, the perfection, the promise, the purpose. Now, the bottom line, the practical value of the resurrection of Christ. Here's where the rubber meets the road. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, those are, those are some uh, ten points on the resurrection described. In the next few moments now, the resurrection documented. Again, I said, I'll say again, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and uh, these proofs will stand up in any earthly court. The Scripture offers a number of facts that strongly prove that Jesus did indeed rise again from the dead. And uh, there's the empty tomb. If Christ didn't rise again, what happened to his body? Well, uh, they say his friends did uh, remove it, but his friends didn't remove it, for they were as surprised as anybody else. They didn't remove it, and his enemies did not remove it, because we know that they were bribed to say that his disciples did. So the tomb is empty. If his friends didn't take him out of the tomb, and if his enemies uh, made sure they didn't, then you have an idea that God did. So the empty tomb. And then the tremendous and sudden change in the lives of the disciples. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Let's take two of them here. Simon Peter, just before the resurrection, Simon Peter is seen bitterly denying his Savior but after the resurrection, he is seen boldly declaring his Savior. And uh, something had to take place, and that was the resurrection. And that of John the Apostle. Uh, just prior to the resurrection, John displayed total contempt toward the Samaritans. Remember, the Samaritans sort of snubbed Jesus, and he says, Call down fire from heaven and zap them into hell. But after the resurrection, he displays total compassion toward the Samaritans. And in Acts chapter 8, he's in the city of Samaria, and he's doing his best to lead him to Christ. And another proof is the silence from both the Romans and the Pharisees. Not once did either of these enemy groups ever attempt to deny Christ's resurrection. 
They hated it and tried to suppress it, but they could not refute it. And then the change from Saturday to Sunday as the main day of worship. Well, I've got time to read this or not, but this is, I believe, one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection. You might not think it to be the change from Saturday to Sunday, but let me read it here. Imagine the following. While visiting a foreign country, you are suddenly seized by some terrorists and held hostage in solitary confinement for 90 days. And during this time, you are permitted absolutely no contact with the outside world. And after three months, for apparently no reason, you are released and allowed to return home. And upon arrival, however, you learn some incredible news. During your absence, all Christian churches everywhere no longer gather for worship on Sunday, but instead assemble on Tuesday of each week. Your immediate question, of course, would be, what in the world? could have happened during those 90 days causing Christians to abandon their 2,000-year-old custom of worshiping on Sunday. I think that would get your attention. Yet this is exactly what happened in Palestine shortly after the resurrection of Christ. As ingrained as the Sabbath was in the hearts and history of the apostles, it would have taken some fantastic event to change their thinking here. And that was the resurrection. And then another proof of the empty tomb or of the resurrection of Christ, you have the existence of the church. In less than 50 years after Christ's death, the Christian church had become a mighty power causing the Roman government to have to deal with it. Now, that's, that's, that had to be uh, a miracle like the resurrection. And finally, the various appearances of Christ following the resurrection. And during the 40 days that he lived on this earth before his, ascension, uh, before his ascension, our Lord appeared on no less than ten occasions, five on the first day and five on the remaining 39 days. The first day, the five appearances to Mary Magdalene, to some women, to Simon Peter, to two disciples, to ten disciples in the upper room. That was the first Sunday. And then the remaining... 39 days, uh, to Thomas and the ten apostles in the upper room, to seven apostles by the Galilean Sea, to the apostles and 500 disciples, to James, a half-brother of Christ, and to the 11 apostles on the Mount of Olives. Uh, Dr. John Walford, uh, the second president of Dallas Theological Seminary, has written these words, taken as a whole, the appearances are of such various character and of so many people under so many different circumstances that proof of the resurrection of Christ is as solid as any historical fact that could, could be cited in the first century. Um, as usual, I'd like to end this session, as I do many sessions, by quoting from a song, and there's one taken from John 20, verse 28, where he says, my Lord and my God. And the song says, Rise, O church, and lift your voices. Christ has conquered death and hell. Sing as all the earth rejoices, resurrection anthems swell. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ, the risen King. Now, let's see if there's anything else. No, I think uh, I've got time to read the last stanza of this before we close this session. Doubt may lift its head to murmur, scoffers mock and sinners jeer, but the truth proclaims a wonder, thoughtful hearts receive with cheer. He is risen, He is risen, now receive the risen King. Do you know there are... 31,173 verses in this book. There are 840,000, 800, almost, I'm sorry, 774,747 words, almost 800,000 words. And I would think probably the greatest one word is salvation. The greatest three words are some words that some angels spoke to some women who came to the empty tomb that first Easter Sunday. And they said, Why seek ye the living among the dead. He is not here. And now, I think the three most thrilling words in all the Bible. He is not here. He 
is risen. And that's the message, and that's the hope of the Christian faith.